I'm Bobby Lee, and this is The Bobby Lee Show. Today we have with us Eustace Mullins, a lecturer, an author, author of many books, a scholar, Washington Lee University, and today we're going to be talking about several different subjects. But this particular subject is the most important for today's political venue. And Eustace has written a book called The World Order. Now, Mr. Mullins has been working since for the last 50 years to research important questions that need to be answered in relationship of middle America to the political evolution. Eustace, tell us a little bit, if you would, how you got started in being an author. Well, I had always intended to be an author, but I had intended to write uh, novels, perhaps some poems, and uh, I had absolutely no interest in any research or any nonfiction work. I didn't consider that as creative writing. So I met a poet, uh, a very bohemian person named Ezra Pound, who was then incarcerated without trial on a more or less lifetime basis. And um, he asked me to look into the banking interest, the Federal Reserve System. Uh, at the Library of Congress there in Washington, D.C., and I did this, and I found it to be quite an interesting story, which launched me on research which continues to the present day. Now, this book, The New World Order, how does the New World Order deal with the banking interest in America and across the world? Well, you see, in studying the banking uh, system in the United States, I found it was part of an international system of banking uh, called central banks in Europe, and that the Federal Reserve System, which we had here, was simply an American version of the central banks they had in Europe. And I also found that these banks did not exist as some entity in some world of their own. They were an integral part of what I came to call the world order. Now, Eustace, <clears throat> this new world order and this banking system, I was under the impression that the banks themselves were American banks and it was the federal government that owned the banks. Are you telling me that that our government itself doesn't own these banks? Well, our government doesn't own anything. We really don't have a government. We're just a colony of England. Hmm. How can you say that a colony of England? Well, I know that they have the Republican Party and the Democrat parties, and, and I go down to the local bank, and I can cash a dollar bill, can't I? Oh, well, you, you can go into any colony of, of Great Britain and cash a check. Uh, that doesn't mean you're in an independent nation. Would you trace for me the colony of Great Britain to the United States and the banks? If I went to, if I put a Federal Reserve note in the bank today, how can I say that that, or how can you tell me that's a part of a colony of Great Britain? Well, you see, we started out as a colony of Great Britain, and then presumably we won political independence uh, in the uh, American Revolution. But you see, uh, the American Revolution was not against the bank. The American Red, uh, Revolution was against King George III. So we won against King George III, but we didn't win against uh, the Bank of England, of which King George III was a major stockholder. So King George lost this wonderful colony over here, but he retained the banking control and continued to uh, get his interest and his profits from uh, his American colony, just as before. Okay, let's go from King George to the Federal Reserve. What happened in between? Because there was some time in there, and some people say that Andrew Jackson was one of the best presidents this country ever had. Could you tell us about him, and what did he do in regard to banking? Well, you see, immediately after the Revolution, when we had our wonderful independence, and we could have the Fourth of July and shoot off firecrackers and still pay interest to the Bank of England, which no one seemed to mind, because they didn't know about it, and so... Uh, uh, Andrew Hamilton established or reestablished the Bank of England presence in the United States of America immediately after the Revolution, called the First Bank of the United States, which Jefferson strongly opposed. And when Jefferson became president, he refused to renew the charter of this foreign central bank, the First Bank of the United States, so it went out of existence. And in revenge for that, a England declared war on us, and we had the War of 1812, which was simply a banking war. Of course, you won't uh, read that in any history book in England or in the United States. They tell you that American seamen were being impressed uh, by the British Navy. They would stop American ships and impress American seamen. And this was the occasion of the war. Well, that had nothing to do with it. It was simply the Bank of England said, we're going to punish the United States for refusing to renew the charter of the First Bank of the United States. So anyway, 
we, uh, the First Bank of the United States disappeared, and then uh, Nicholas Biddle, an agent of James Rothschild of Paris, uh, chartered a second bank of the United States. And it was doing quite well until Andrew Jackson came along, and he said to the bankers, you are a nest of vipers, and by God, I will rout you out. And so he did. He removed all of the government deposits from the Second Bank of the United States in 1836, which caused it to collapse. And in revenge, the Bank of England suspended uh, all American paper, which caused the first great depression in the United States called the Panic of 1837. That was strictly a banker's panic. And of course, then the Rothschilds came in and bought up uh, American securities at one cent on a dollar and established a great many of the great American fortunes, including J.P. Morgan. But Andrew Jackson himself, would, you would credit him with at least taking a stand against this banking monopoly that is destroying his America. Well, he was a general and a patriot and an American, and uh, to him, the bankers were Satan incarnate. They were robbing and looting this country. They were oppressing the people. They were causing financial uh, depression and widespread suffering, and he said, I'm going to go after them, and he did. Unfortunately, the history books do not tell you why he did anything that he did, so uh, the American children go to school and they have no idea what all this was about. Neither do the college students. Neither do the, do the graduate college students. You know, I saw a beautiful statue of Andrew Jackson not long ago up in Jacksonville, Florida. A lot of people don't realize that the state of Florida, the first governor, was Andrew Jackson. Yes, that's right. And the city of Jacksonville was named after this wonderful patriot and hero of the American middle class. Now, let's talk a little, let's go a little bit further. You mentioned the word Rothschilds. W where did that name come from, please? Well, uh, there was a family of moneylenders in Frankfurt, Germany, named Bauer, which means peasant. And why these moneylenders were trying to call themselves peasants, I don't know, because none of them had ever been near a plow in their life. And so uh, they were moneylenders, and uh, they needed some uh, way of advertising their business. And so the founder of this dynasty, the House of Rothschild, uh, put up a red shield above his door so that people who came from various parts of Europe to, uh, to change money with him uh, could find it. And so uh, after... Uh, a few years, uh, people don't, didn't know any, who Bauer was, but they knew the Rothschild. The Red Shield was Rothschild, and so uh, he simply began to call himself Rothschild. Okay, now he uh, he died eventually, but uh, did he leave a dynasty of some sort? I mean, how did this happen? Well, he left five sons who were very well trained by this man, who by that time had become the outstanding uh, money lender of Europe. Due to a very peculiar circumstance, King George III and the Bank of England wanted to pub punish uh, the American colonists for being so obstreperous and for refusing to give all of their profits to the Bank of England from their income. And so uh, uh, when they re rebelled, then the British Army did not really want to fight their American cousins. So uh, King George said, well, I've got to get somebody else to fight this war. I need some mercenaries, some hired soldiers. And over in Germany, the Elector of Hesse, a German province, had a very well-trained group of uh, soldiers called the Hessians. And so he said, uh, well, I'll rent these out to you, King George, who was a German himself, by the way, a Hanover. And uh, uh, he said, uh, for $5 million, you can have this nice army. And so George said, all right. And then when the Elector of Hesse got this $5 million, uh, he said, what am I going to do with it? And they said, well, this... Uh, there's a very good uh, investor and financial advisor named Meyer Amstel Rothschild in Frankfurt. So he let uh, Meyer Amstel lend out this money, which was the biggest chunk of capital in Europe at that time, $5 million. And so uh, Amstel spread it around, and pretty soon he brought back uh, $20 million uh, to the elector, who was very pleased, and uh, kept $5 million for, him, for his efforts. So now he was a monetary power himself, and of course the elector of Hess let it be known that if you had money to invest, uh, put it in Meyer Amstel's hands. So when Meyer died, he had five sons, and uh, so they dispersed themselves over the five capitals of Europe, and Nathan uh, went to London, James went to Paris, and so forth. So they now had total control of the monetary resources of Western civilization, the entire continent of Europe. 
And um, they had developed some very interesting techniques. One was that uh, the courier went from James in Paris to Nathan uh, Mayer in London, uh, and he wanted a million dollars in gold. So he would give him a note saying, I want a million dollars in gold. But he would not sign it. So if uh, someone came into a Rothschild office, uh, a courier, and said, I have a request here for a million dollars, it's signed James Rothschild, and Nathan knew it was fake because they didn't sign their communications. Mm, mm, mm. A little trickery even then, but I think <laughs> good little trickery. Well, you live and learn, you know. That's right. So we're talking about the New World Order. In the New World Order, we had the war with England, and that was the Revolutionary War. And there was the banking system that was set up, and that was Alexander Hamilton that set it up originally after that. Thomas Jefferson then went ahead and decided this was not good for the American people. And then after that, we had the War of 1812, and then we come to Andrew Jackson, and he fought the bankers again, and then we have the Rothschilds, and their dynasty is building. Tell us about the Rothschilds now, how they enter into the picture as far as, shall we say, the Federal Reserve is concerned. Well, the Rothschilds realized early on you don't make any money by lending somebody $200 to buy a used car. They only dealt with governments and with the uh, kings of Europe, and um, they only handled government loans because that's where the big money was. And you see, they realized it was a sure thing because if you lent money to a government and they didn't repay you, uh, then you w they would never get any more money. And they always needed money for wars and for uh, to build Versailles and so forth. Uh, uh, to be a king means you spend a lot of money. You're a big spender. And uh, they could always tax their people enough to repay the Rothschilds their money, so they had nothing to worry about. And um, so... By 1880, the Rothschilds really owned all of Europe, and they owned a large part of the United States secretly because they uh, always advertised and promoted the idea that the Rothschilds had no activities in the United States, and they did not because they worked through uh, August Belmont, who was their named representative, and they also worked through J.P. Morgan and Kuhn Loeb Company, which were their secret representatives, and by 1896, uh, these two Rothschild firms, J.P. Morgan and Kuhn Loeb, own 96% of all the railroad mileage in the United States. Wow! Talk about a monopoly there. And that was that's in congressional reports. Uh, I got that right out of uh, most of my work, by the way, comes from congressional reports. So you do researching on congressional reports, and how far do you back to these this research information go, Eustace? About 5,000 years. 5,000 years. We're talking to Eustace Mullins ladies and gentlemen, and we're talking about the New World Order. Well, tell us then, the Rothschilds, tell us about the Federal Reserve, now they've become involved in the Federal Reserve, and what about Soviet Russia? How did Soviet Russia come into this New World Order situation, Mr. Mullins? Well, uh, Soviet Russia was always part of the World Order, and in fact, the Soviet Empire, the evil empire, which we heard so much about in the 1950s, we were digging... Uh, atom bomb shelters in our backyards to protect us from this catastrophe which was going to happen at any moment and which was good for the uh, contracting industry but it didn't uh, really help anybody as far as avoiding atomic bombs so the Soviet, Soviet Empire came about because of greed and envy now communism of course is based on hatred greed and envy but what people don't realize is that the Russian Revolution came about because of the greed and envy of King George V of England, 